Welcome to STATS virtual event, Augmented the Future of Brain Control Prosthetic Limbs in partnership with NOVA. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Gideon Gill, Managing Editor here at STAT and a co-producer and writer of the documentary. I'm sure you know how this works by now, uh, So, but before we get started, a few quick housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, you sh should see several icons. Use the chat feature to chat among yourselves or to send a message directly to the STAT team. Noted as STAT events. Please do not put your questions for us in the chat. Uh, if you do have a question that you would like to ask during the event, please use the Q&A feature to type your question and we will try to answer it live. In the Q&A window, you should also be able to see the questions that other attendees have asked and upvote the questions you would most like to have answered. We will, be, we will be taking questions throughout the chat, so please don't wait until the end to submit them. This is part of what makes these events engaging and fun. We'd very much like to hear from you, and thanks again for being here. Before we get started, I would like to welcome Julia Court, co-executive producer at NOVA, for an introduction of today's event. Please note that her remarks have been pre-recorded. And immediately following Julia's remarks, we will be playing a trailer from Augmented to help kick off today's discussion. Thank you, Gideon. And thank you to all of you for joining today for this conversation about Augmented. My co-EP, Chris Schmidt, and I were so happy to be able to partner with STAT and bring this wonderful film to PBS because it fits so perfectly with our mission. At NOVA, we're committed to telling stories that empower and inspire people with knowledge about science, how it's done, what it can achieve, and especially science that can have such profound impacts on human lives. Because we believe that the more people are actively engaged in scientific ideas and how they're applied, the stronger and more equitable a society we can build. We see science as a profoundly human endeavor. It's part of our fundamental nature to ask questions and look for answers. And that is so clear in Augmented, from Hugh Herr's dramatic personal story and how the loss of his legs inspired him to become a scientist and engineer, to the team of doctors and engineers who work to develop this entirely new way of performing amputations, to patients like Jim Ewing, who allowed them to test their ideas on his body. And as the film shows, all this work has enormous potential to help people and improve their lives. And at the same time, raises challenging ethical questions about who will have access to these groundbreaking surgeries and technologies. So thank you to STAT for all your work making this powerful film and for hosting events like this where we can dig deeper into the science and the provocative questions raised by the film. We also want to thank PBS, CPB, and the Nova Science Trust for making Nova programs like this possible. If you haven't seen the film yet or you'd like to watch it again after the panel, you can stream it at pbs.org nova and on the PBS video app. Now let's take a look at the trailer for Augmented and then Gideon will get the conversation started with our panel. Thank you again. Thank you uh, to Julia for that wonderful introduction and I hope you all enjoyed the trailer. Um, here now to join me for the rest of today's discussion um, uh, is our panel. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Matthew Carty, who's a staff surgeon at Brigham Women's Hospital and director of the BWH Lower Extremitary, Extremity Reconstruction Program. He also directs strategy and innovation at the BWH Stepping Strong Center uh, as associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School and a research scientist at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, we also have with us today, Jim Ewing, who is the first uh, patient to receive this new uh, procedure, this new kind of amputation, which is now named for him, the Ewing amputation. Um, welcome, Jim. Uh, we have also with us Matt Orr, uh, who is uh, the assistant professor at the Med Medill School of Journalism, Media Integrated Marketing Communication at Northwestern and uh, former uh, director of multimedia at STAT and the director of Augmented. 
Uh, we also have uh, Dr. Shriya Srinivasan, uh, who's joining us from India today. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher and with the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Professor Hugh Herr, uh, who you saw in that clip, um, was scheduled to be with us today, but unfortunately, the weather here in New England has disrupted his travel plan, so he will not be able to join us. Um, so to start off, um, I wondered, uh, Dr. Cardi, um, we saw in that clip, um, Tyler Kleit, uh, who was an MIT, who at the time we shot the film was an MIT PhD student say that limb amputation had, hadn't changed since the Civil War era. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about why was that? Why, with all the progress that's gone on in other realms of medicine, amputation had basically stayed the same? Uh, well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me as part of the panel today. Um, and thanks to Matt Orr for all your passion in making this project, uh, bringing it to the kind of general public in the form of this amazing film and obviously everybody else who was involved in it, but, uh, but thank you. Um, I, actually, I, I, would, um, I would even take issue with what you said in terms of it being since Civil War, some would argue that if you, even if you looked at depictions of limb amputation that date back as far as 2000 years, that they'd actually don't look that much different than the way traditional amputation has been done even up until very recently. Um, the reasons behind that, I, I think frankly have to do with the fact that what we demanded of a meaningful residual limb um, ha, in, has changed remarkably. So, you know, for, for thousands of years, we either didn't have any way of interfacing with a with a residual limb, or did so in very rudimentary ways, like with a like a tree branch or a peg leg or or something on that order. Um, there's been a remarkable advance in terms of the, the both the biology and technology that that can now interface with residual limbs. So what we what what comprises a meaningful stump, if you will, has changed dramatically even in the last ten years. I see. And what what specifically led to you and uh, Hugh Hurd uh, devising this new way of amputation? What you know? What came together uh, that led you to sort of look at this uh, in a new way? Uh, well, I'll, I'll try to be as concise about this as possible. But the uh, we had actually met, Hugh and I had actually met initially under the auspices of having discussions about. Um, some of the work that our team was doing with regards to limb transplantation. Uh, so we had an initial set of discussions that were completely unrelated to amputation, but that was the context for our initial meeting. Through the course of these discussions, and, and I think this was catalyzed as well by the Boston Marathon bombings, uh, I, our, we had been thinking about ways that we thought maybe amputation could be reinvented. Hugh and his team had been thinking about it from a different angle. Uh, and when we started to talk about this together, it led to a very fruitful set of discussions that ultimately led to this idea of the agonist antagonist myoneural interface or AMI, which is essentially the primary, I think one of the primary innovations of, of what Jim underwent for his surgical procedure. We, and I think, let me just unpack that for a minute. I think one of the things that's very unusual in this instance is that you, a surgeon, uh, got together with a scientist engineer um, and together developed this innovation. And, and we don't see that these realms come together that often. Um, am I right about that? It seems uh, I think that's exactly right. And it's not really intuitive. You would um, you would think that these are discussions that happen all the time, but historically, surgical management uh, of patients like Jim has existed almost entirely separate from the from the prosthetists and folks that fit folks with residual limbs uh, with, with uh, limb extensions or limb restorative function, if you will. Um, I think part of the magic that developed from uh, from the relationship that we all had collectively as a team, and I include Shreya and Tyler and that and, uh, and Matt Carney and the other folks at MIT in that as well, is that we were able to engage in a series of discussions whereby the development of technology informed the development of the surgical procedure. 
And conversely, the evolution of the surgical procedure informed how the technology was developed as well. Um, and and that, is like, that, that is way more powerful than either of us doing this in any, any given silo. And from your perspective, Shriya, you were coming from the engineering side over at MIT. What did you, what insights did you gain from working with uh, Dr. Cardi's team and being over? And I know you were in the animal lab and then actually watched, uh, were part, participated in Jim's surgery, which is shown in the film. Yeah, I mean, thinking about the body, uh from an engineering lens and from a surgical lens can often be very disparate um, processes. And to really merge those and think about, you know, engineering the body and rewiring um, neural conduits to then merge seamlessly with the synthetic substrates. Um, I think that's kind of what came about over the course of this work um, and what we learned to be uh, quite valuable in terms of actually restoring function and sensation. Um, so again, you know, going back to what Matt was saying, really bridging those two disciplines and, and thinking about things cohesively. Um, that was a major insight for me there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the real advances in this procedure was that it restored what's called the, the sense of proprioception. And we have a clip uh, that we that's queued up uh, that I'd like to show now about that. So, Shreya, what? Why is um, uh, proprioception so important for restoring for patients? What What is it that 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 allows? Yeah, absolutely. So, when we go to do a simple task, say I'm, I'm picking up a phone, um, my motor commands from my brain to actually go pick up the phone are constantly being calibrated and updated by the sensory information that tells me if I've made contact with it or how hard I'm gripping it. Um, without that information from a prosthesis, for example, it's very hard to actually operate and do simple things like walk upstairs, um, step off of a curb, um, make contact with objects and know that you've contacted them without visually following uh, the prosthesis. And it's a reason that a lot of patients um, sometimes abandon these really advanced prostheses um, because they lack that functionality and that seamless integration for all of the benefit that they could provide. And so sensory feedback in a nutshell is basically that ability to sense the world around us um, without having to look at it. Thanks. And Dr. Carter, you talked about the Amy. Um, can you what can you explain what that is a little bit more? Why it's so important? You, in that clip we talked it talked about reconnecting muscle pairs. Uh, so if you could just talk about how that, how that works with the brain to recreate um, proprioception. So, uh, so in an uninjured state, and, and I welcome, Shri is always actually 10 times more articulate than I am about some of this stuff, but, uh, but uh, in an uninjured state, the dynamic motion that occurs across any given joint in our body. This is not specific to the ankle or, or the elbow. This is actually true across any given joint that you pick. Um, comes from the concerted um, symphonic motions of at least two muscles acting in tandem, if not more. In many cases, it's actually, it's more. It's a whole, it, it's literally like a symphony of muscles all working at the same time. We're used to thinking about that fairly simplistically in terms of saying, okay, one muscle moves, it brings my wrist down into this position, that's one single motion. That's actually not at all what's happening is that there are, there are complex of muscles that are pulling the wrist down here, but there are also a number of muscles on the back side of the forearm that stretch in tandem with that. And that the, there are specialized fibers within those muscles that in turn transmit information back to the brain that give us this sense of, of high fidelity joint and um, limb position in space. Uh, when we perform a standard amputation, those connections, as the graphic you showed um, uh, depicts, uh, those connections are severed. So these muscles that are normally interacting almost like with an, with an internal pulley system 
uh, they're disconnected from one another. And so the patients are able to trigger kind of half of the equation, if you will, or half the system when they're thinking about moving in the setting of amputation, but the compensatory stretch doesn't occur anymore. And it leads to a, um, a, a disharmonic relationship that in its worst situations can lead to pain actually. Um, and so a lot of times if you talk to patients who have standard amputations, they'll describe their sense of limb and space. They, they may still perceive their ankle being there, but it's discombobulated. It's not anatomically correct. It, ex it exists over in the side. It's either really big or really small. Um, and as I said already, it could, uh, it, it could be actually perceived not only as anatomically incorrect, but actually as a painful limb. Um, towards that, and I just wanted to make one or two other points about this, uh, because I think they're important to understand is that even in the absence of advanced prosthetic technology, so next generation devices like what Q's team is developing in the lab, proprioception is meaningful for patients in many cases uh, wearing standard technology. So we've had patients who have undergone the Ewing amputation who describe having such an exquisite sense of their phantom limb being in being in space that they actually perceive feedback from that phantom that has nothing to do with the technology they actually just they feel like their their phantom is superimposed in space over their limb uh and they actually we've even had we have we have one patient who who described walking through the woods with a standard prosthetic device he stepped in water and because he perceived his phantom being in space he literally felt a sense of water over his limb which is like this is not a prosthetic device that is capable of sensory feedback. And so I mean, that's, we get into really heady spaces talking about some of this stuff. Um, the, the other point that I just wanted to make quickly is that um, I, I know the title of this panel is brain controlled prosthetic devices. That, that's, actually, that's actually not what this is. And I, I mean that with all due respect. What, what, I, what I mean is that people have tried to go directly tapping into the brain to control a device. The fact of the matter is that the way that our bodies are made is such that we have many, many additional receptors present in our native anatomy that allow us to control technology that are much more efficient, much more reliable than going directly after the brain. So the fact of the matter is that we are repurposing normal anatomy in a non-normal state in order to create intuitive pathways for motor control that when coupled with next generation technology are capable of doing things that we've only been able to dream of before, but it's not brain powered, it's actually it's body powered. It's, it's intuitive body control of technology. It utilizes all the design principles that are present already in our bodies. It is, I mean, I think, and it, Jim, you talk about this in the film, and I wanna to turn to you and sort of uh, ask you about this, but that your, your, prosthetic limb is moving in the way you're you're thinking that it's you want it to move and in that sense it's indirect but i i'll push back on you, on you dr Carty. Right, well i mean it's they, yeah so i just want to know if you can sort of talk about that a little bit jim yeah uh, well i think the the term brain control is uh i don't know is rather broad but i'm they're brain controlled in the sense that you're controlling them the same way you control your intact limbs. So if your brain is thinking about moving your toes or moving your ankle or whatever, then yeah, then it's the, it's the same sort of thing. Um, but for, for me, I think what sort of delivered the sense that the, the robotic ankle became part of me was that my, my brain would anticipate certain other movements that would normally occur when you say you push your toes into the floor your knee comes up or your hip moves so when there's a when there's a, a parity between what you anticipate and what actually happens then your your brain your body automatically um, interprets that as oh well things are working normally so let's let's just get going and uh and that was my personal experience anyway. There's actually, <clears throat> sorry to interrupt, but there's a moment in the film where we see Tyler is, you know, working with you and you're, you're walking up and down some steps uh, and they're sort of gathering that information. But 
But what was so striking in that moment for me is just watching you kind of step down on a step and you could see your foot is just kind of stepping down, reaching for it just as, as we normally would, right? Um, that, was, that was kind of an, an interesting moment in, in all of this, this work um, was when I, I think um, Hugh and Tyler and maybe Matt were conversing somewhere and I, I just started going up and down the stairs much to Tyler's dismay um, and I said hey look at this when I raise my knee to go up the stairs my toes are coming up and and they asked are are you doing that on purpose I said no it's just what you do when you go upstairs you lift your toes to clear the steps and when you you know conversely you coming down the stairs you you your toes point down reaching for the next step down and that was not something that I was thinking about consciously it was just the my my brain felt that my foot was still there and and was using the the robot accordingly I also recall there was a moment that first day when you the, the first time you got to wear it and having it on for a few hours and then the moment it came off you you said and of course I wasn't filming this I should have been but you said um I my my I feel the absence of it. My muscles are firing, but it's but nothing is happening. Yeah, d during the whole uh, initial phases of calibrating and, um, and and getting it attached to me, Tyler would turn the robot off frequently without um, telling me he was going to turn it off. And I I asked him. I said, "You you got to tell me when you're turning it off because it's kind of abrupt. It was quite a shock to me to." All of a sudden, you know, the, the foot is there and then it's gone and then it's there and then it's gone. And it was uh, mildly traumatic. Hmm. Do you, Jim, we have a question here from one of the members of the audience, um, which is so in the in the lab and in the film, you're using a, a prototype um, prosthetic um, that's got bells and whistles that you're the normal prosthetic that you use doesn't do you feel you are you still able to have this um sense of feeling that it's your leg when it's just a normal prosthetic leg that you're using or how is um, it different i think so um because the the muscles in my residual limb are are active when i'm walking um those muscles are still firing trying to operate my ankle or my foot um, while I'm walking around. And that actually gives me a, a pretty solid connection to, um, to the socket that I wear. And in some cases, I've, I flex those muscles to hold the socket more firmly onto my leg. I mean, I have a, a standard um, attachment. Um, there's a variety of different attachments on the market. And I have a fairly standard pin system. But um, moments when I'm doing, uh, let's say, skiing or hiking or, or climbing, there's times when I want a firmer connection to the socket for better precision. And I just I fire those muscles and they expand within the socket and hold it tighter onto my body. Does, um, so the and Shreya, maybe you can talk about this, whether there have not how many how many patients are there now that have received the um, uh, Ewing amputation, uh, both for the leg and then also uh, the procedure has now been done a few times on the arm. Um, where we, I think it's about are we up to about thirty procedures? Is that about right, Matt? That's right, right? About thirty below, uh, thirty yeah. lower limb and two so upper limb. Been, there's been thirty. 30 patients have undergone below knee amputation utilizing this Ewing procedure or technique. That's actually been in 34 limbs because actually several patients actually wound up either initially getting bilateral amputations or progressing to bilateral amputations. Um, we performed a very, uh, an ad we've adapted this to above knee amputations in six patients. Uh, we've done four patients with upper extremity amputations and one patient to date, although we have about six in the pipeline for revision procedures. In other words, those are people who had already undergone amputation and we are going back and reopening their leg uh, and creating the type of functionality or hoping to uh, recreate the kind of functionality that Jim has. 
so and so that would be like people like we're talking about the revision people like you who who had exactly. proper amputations yes uh, and he talks in the film about himself wanting to undergo that procedure someday what uh in these in the other patients uh in addition to jim i mean this is all we have to remember this is still research uh that, that's going on here clinical trial um are you seeing similar results to what uh jim has experienced in terms of a feeling of um that um that the leg feels like it's their it's their own leg uh it's part of their body uh, in, in general, yes, uh, they're, um, you know, we're actually, we're getting remarkably close to being able to say that this is no longer research or experimental surgery. And at some point you say, we've done this enough. We've seen, uh, you know, this has been performed safely or has had similar results enough times uh, that it's no longer considered an experimental procedure. So we're actually, we're getting very, very close to that. In, in general, yes, we have seen uh, the types of what Jim's experience, and in some cases, actually even more profound uh, senses of the, the phantom limb still being there in space and so on. Uh, you know, we have had complications. This is what happens with experimental surgery. Uh, fortunately, everybody's been safe and everybody's healed and so on. Um, so it's uh, it's an evolving science, but in general, and we're in the process of actually publishing all of our, our data about this right now, um, we have seen results similar to Jim's manifest in, in you know, 30 plus other people. And one of the papers that was recently published that Shriya that you were involved on was, um, if you could talk about involved brain imaging to look at how um, proprioception um, is showing up in people's brains. Can you describe yeah. that work? There's commonly the saying, use it or lose it. And that's true of the brain. So when you don't use a part of the brain, uh, you tend to lose it. And um, in folks that have had a standard amputation, it's well known that the cortical area for that specific limb starts to become thinner. Um, and so over time, people actually have mixed signals and the motor and sensory circuitry um, work in ways that are abnormal to some degree. In the patients that have had the Amy, we've largely seen that that's not the case. They actually maintain that cortical thickness in the brain, um, and they are receiving sensory feedback in the area that is supposed to receive sensory feedback from the leg. And so, you know, the big takeaway here is that if you take the time and effort to preserve and, and rewire things in a naturalistic manner in the periphery, that has a corresponding effect in the brain. Um, and is able to sustain those sorts of connections and um, processes. So that's been a very exciting result. Um, we were actually very surprised uh, as to the extent to which it showed up in the data. Um, and of course, I think this holds benefits, whether a patient receives or doesn't receive a myoelectric prosthesis to go with the amputation amputation um, in the long run, just keeping those circuits in the brain healthier and functioning closer to normal. So there's actually the surgery that we're t that we're talking about, and then there's also the the new state of the art prosthetic devices. And Dr. Carter, you talked about that we're kind of getting close to the surgery be being no longer experimental, um, and it has now been done at Walter Reed. Has, has done the surgery. Are there other places where it's beginning to? Yeah, actually, the, the, I think this is one of the exciting aspects of this because ideally, you know, our, ultimately our dream is that assuming that we see Jim's results duplicated in many, many other people, that this becomes the standard way of doing an amputation. And, and we're able to offer these benefits to patients worldwide um, and potentially even patients who have already undergone amputation. Um, so uh, typically there's about a 20 year adoption curve uh, within medicine for new procedures, but we've already seen, I think our, our collaborators at MIT, uh, sorry, at Walter Reed with whom we work very closely, they've done eight Ewing amputations. There was one done at the University of California, San Diego about um, eight months ago. There was one we just found out about at UCSF that was done about a month ago. There was one done in, in Germany about two weeks ago. So there have, um, uh, there has been actually pretty rapid adoption 
uh, at least the principles behind this. And of course, what will happen is that there'll be iterations on this. Other people will think about it and adapt it for other indications or even improve on the UN unification in ways that we haven't thought of yet. Uh, so that's a really exciting thing to be a part of. And what is the, uh, you know, one of the issues that's raised in the film um, is the issue of accessibility to, to, these, to this procedure and the, uh, its cost versus standard procedures. Um, is insurance, um, and Jim, I'd like you to speak to this as well, is, you know, how, I know there's, you know, for many people with, um, who, with limb loss, uh, it's a real challenge to afford not just surgery, but also the prosthetics. And, and I wonder where do things stand with um, insurance coverage for the procedure, as well as some of these new prosthetics that work, uh, that, that are designed to work with it? Um, well, unfortunately, it's it's kind of all over the place. Every insurance company has uh, different policies regarding um, prosthetics coverage. Um, some cover 100%, some cover 80%, you know, whatever. And almost universally, none of them cover prosthetics with microprocessors. They still consider them all um, prototypes or experimental. And so... Um, people who could use the, the microprocessor types and uh, benefit from using them can't get them unless they can pay for them out of pocket. And in some cases, these things are hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, you know, probably the, the uh, most obvious example is for people with above knee amputations, they... Um, require a, a, a mechanical knee that maybe has a microprocessor or doesn't have a microprocessor. Um, and it's, I've, I've heard some horror stories basically of patients trying to get access to those and fighting with insurance companies for uh, months, years, even are uh, going to court over it to, to get access to these things. So um, yeah, it's, there's, there's a pretty large, um, disparity in access to the best prosthetics. And um, I, I think if, if we look at the way uh, healthcare is distributed in the United States, you know, the, one of the goals is to, supposed to be health maintenance and, and uh, helping keep people healthy. And movement, uh, being able to move is a huge component of remaining healthy. And so getting the, the best prosthetics available helps people move, helps people um, stay active or uh, exercise, whatever. And that in the end results in, in better health overall. So are there what what can be done to make the to get these um, prosthetics to everyone? Is it? Well, I think um, you know I'm not an insurance expert, but I think uh, a lot of insurance companies use um, the the federal system, um, Medicare, Medicaid, their standards, their codes to decide what they're going to cover. And currently, um, Medicaid and Medicare does not cover a lot of microprocessor prosthetics. So if, if we could get movement there, um, get coverage there, then the other, the insurance companies, private insurance companies would eventually fall in line. Well, I, I think toward this end, um, just one or two thoughts is that, is that up until now, I think part of the resistance from insurance carriers is that there has not been a clearly benefit, clearly demonstrated benefit of this augmented technology for the people who would be using it. Now, now one thing that we actually didn't say is that there was, there was a set, this set of films of Jim using the technology that was developed in the lab at MIT, but there's actually a, there's another set of films of another patient of mine who had a standard amputation using exactly the same technology, and he could not do the things that Jim could do. Uh, with with the with the, with the same device, so to the extent that we're moving into a sphere in which the 
if we, if we think about this as a system, we think about developing procedures that enable patients to use technology better and more robustly, there is actually, there's a huge difference in function and well-being in that, in that argument. So the more that we can demonstrate that something like the Ewing amputation in conjunction with new technology yields a far better result for patients, I actually think that that actually will lead to insurance carriers saying, okay, there's now a value in thinking about having somebody like standard, standard below knee prosthetic devices don't have an ankle that can move like what was pictured in the film or a subtalar joint that can move side to side. That, that's totally science fiction that's now become science fact. But the fact that Jim can do that in a meaningful way, in part because of the way that his amputation was done, provides justification for the technology from an insurance perspective that I hope will gain traction as more and more of this type of work is done. Um, Gideon, one of the questions that you had also asked is whether or not we've had issues with insurance coverage for the surgical aspect of this. The answer is in general, no. Uh, fortunately, this is not the kind of operation that, that requires really advanced technology. Like we, we can do this pretty much in a community hospital. We can do it in a major academic center. Um, how long patients stay in the hospital is more or less the same as they stay for a standard amputation. Uh, and so, so at least in the setting of a below knee uh, of a Ewing amputation, so we have actually had remarkably little um, pushback um, from insurers about the surgical care for what it's worth. I see. Do and Jim, there's a question that that one of the uh, somebody has asked about whether you still feel pain uh, from your in your uh, leg. Or, um, you talk in the film about choosing to have this procedure because you were in so much pain. Right. So that. That pain, um, my main motivation for choosing amputation, that pain is is gone. Um, then, you know, since then, there's there's pain, or I, I don't want to call it pain. I'd say just discomfort with um, everyday use of a prosthetic. It's but it's manageable, tolerable, um, and far far less than what I experienced before amputation. I see. So. And actually, if I can just jump in, yeah, this is no, actually please, one of the yeah. things that we kept seeing come up as I started to work with these patients. And it was somewhat of an unexpected, actually, benefit, I would say. Um, but a lot of them reported these significant decreases in pain and just increased phantom limb capability, phantom limb sensation. Um, and, and that in itself, I think, is, is one reason to get the Amy, um, even if you aren't using a very advanced prosthesis today. So I uh, <clears throat> did some reporting uh, for another story uh, for the, the person who had, who, who had the first person to have the surgery uh, on the arm uh, applying the Amy technique. And I do know with that patient, he was experiencing a lot of pain in, in the hand that, um, you know, after that surgery, that pain was gone. Um, it's quite interesting, though, he um, uh, was was missing. Um, a couple of fingers and um and and now he's he feels like he his hand is there but it's it's his brain still thinks that those uh fingers are missing it's quite fascinating yeah th this speaks to a sense yeah. of um what you know the, the the scientific terminology is embodiment is is the sense of a limb being not, whether it's a prosthetic limb or a phantom limb but some but still being part of somebody's corporeal integrity. And, and the, like, you know, what Jim has, what Jim eloquently describes and is, is shown in the film is really a remarkable sense of augmented embodiment beyond what is typically witnessed in the relationship between a patient with a standard amputation and a standard prosthetic device. Um, you know, toward Matt or towards the, 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 one of the points that you just raised is that actually there's, there's actually a whole, <laughs> the whole set of documentaries that at this point <laughs> uh, patient experiences in this regard, but there's a fascinating, um, there's, there's a fascinating set of footage of one of the patients at Walter Reed who underwent one of the initial upper extremity versions of Jim's operation, where he describes his phantom now existing in space in a way that is way more functional than what his actual limb felt like when it was still in place. And he described, you know, kind of his, when, when he still had his arm, it was, it was encased in like, in, in, in like concrete and super painful and kind of gnarled and, and non-anatomic. 
And he describes now essentially being able to summon this phantom limb that literally kind of telescopes out of his arm as far as his brain is concerned when he triggers the emis and he can summon this limb that exists now in space in a way that feels way more natural and way more comfortable than when he actually had his limb his, his anatomic limb and that's like just think about that for a second that's a that's a totally amazing thing to to, to ponder for a moment from the engineering or surgical perspective I mean, that maps directly back to kind of how the procedure is done, right? Are we tying all of those muscles down together such that they feel cramped or stuck? Or are we allowing them to dynamically move like they do in our natural limbs? Um, and can we use that thought process, you know, in the future to think about how we design such procedures um, where we do need patients to feel a certain way um, afterward, yeah. I'd like to go back to the, the pain topic for a moment. So, so the film is called Augmented, and, and you know, presumably that it's implying that people are going to be able to augment themselves, to run faster, jump higher, potentially fly. And I've had people see, um, see the film and various other clips of me using these robotic, robotic uh, prosthetics, and they're like, oh man, that's so cool. I want one of those, or I want to be able to do that. And they they forget that something pretty traumatic has to happen before they can use those things. And you know, if if an able-bodied person came to me and said, I want to cut my legs off so I can have these robotic legs, I would think they're a fool because it's it's not a simple um, process. It's not without pain, it's not without um, physical cost, let's say. And um, I mean, being an amputee is sometimes really inconvenient, like maybe getting up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, you either have to use crutches or crawl or um, wheelchair or whatever. I mean, there's things that people tend to overlook when they, they think about augmenting themselves with prosthetic components. That that's a good moment to pivot into this. So one of the things, uh, and I think, thank you for raising that because it's such an important point. In the film, one of the things that um, Professor Hurd talks about is he says, we're at a point now where, where normalcy is not the pinnacle of human capability. Um, and, and he says that in 20 years, limb amputation will not be a disability. And there will be several dimensions that are augmentation. Um, and he's referring to the idea that, um, that you can, you know, run faster, jump higher. Um, and I wonder, in the film, you, Jim, you talk about, um, actually, after Hugh's accident, uh, when he was a teenager in Mount Washington, um, and his, and he, um, had his legs amputated, he then crafted these prosthetic legs that were uh, uh, long that that were longer than than his regular legs had been. And people got angry and said he was cheating. Can you just talk yeah. about what the reaction to that was? I mean, well, the 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 photo of him climbing with those the ridiculously long uh, <laughs> limbs. I think that was just him being goofy because that's the way Hugh is sometimes. Um, but yeah, there was in the climbing community, people were legitimately um, uh, complaining that, oh, well, he has an advantage. And um, he would on specific uh, terrain, very specific climbs, there would be a problem where he couldn't get his foot up high enough so he would put a shorter prosthetic on that side and have a longer one on the other side so he could reach a particular hold or something. So he's, you know, he's making modifications to his limbs in order to overcome a particular challenge. And, and yeah, people thought that was cheating. But you know, when I lived with Hugh, I saw him crawling on all fours around the house um, or you know, climbing up onto the counter because he wasn't wearing his legs because he had blisters or something or having to crawl to the bathroom in the middle of the night like it's sure having having a uh, the ability to adapt your limbs might be an advantage in some ways but it's a 
pretty serious disadvantage in others. Yeah. And then there was, you know, Oscar Pistorius when he uh, tried to run in the Olympics with um, with his blades, um, was first banned from the Olympics. And there was uh, people said he was cheating. Um, and um, and I think so. One of the things, you know, in the film is we ex the film explores what are the ethical implications here and essentially um, the idea that we're getting to a, a stage where with this new technology that's uh, where the uh, the this you know prosthetic device a robotic prosthetic device is so well integrated with the the the, the, the biology the biological that you have sort of almost a new category of person um, and cyborg. Um, cy <laughs> yes a cyborg uh, and um, how you know, as as an early cyborg, Jim, how do you feel? Or do, how do people react to you with um, right now? Uh, I, I don't know. My my personal experience with the the amputee community accepting this new thing it was it it wasn't I wasn't welcomed <laughs> with open arms initially. Um, because you know people are sensitive to being um, uh, obsolete, let's say. So standard amputations, uh, people with standard amputations, they they view it as well. I, this is it. This is it for me. And something supposedly better comes along, and they they're kind of hesitant to accept it or believe it. Um, so it's. I, I don't know that that's my personal experience anyway and and looking at the world of um international sport um you know the the paralympic committee will probably never uh permit powered prosthetics in competition but that doesn't mean that i i can i can sort of envision a a separate category of powered prosthetics powered uh, augmented individuals where there are no rules. You can you can use whatever technology has to offer to enhance the performance. Yeah, if you you talk to Hugh, he'll tell you that in the future everyone's going to be want, wanting to watch the augmented Olympics rather than the uh, exactly, exactly. The normal Olympics because that's going to be way more exciting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For sure, um, the. There's a lot of questions here about the revision procedure, um, and uh, Dr. Card, I wonder if you could uh, just talk a little bit about what, who, who, who do you envision, or who do you, what sorts of patients are going to be able to get that procedure? Um, what, how is it, um, how is it done that's different from the procedure, say that was that you that was done with Jim? Uh, so, so this is uh, this is also a set of procedures that are being done under um, what's called IRB approval. It basically, means they're considered experimental surgery. So, we are very much figuring out how to how to do this. Um, the you know through the course of the uh, of the foundational work that was done in the lab by Shreya and Tyler and others, um, we came to understand that there are at least two different ways of building Amy's. Uh, there is the, the, the manner that we utilized in Jim's case, in which case his anatomy was all still intact, that's referred to as a made of Amy, but there's also the possibility of literally building Amy's de novo from by, by connecting nerve endings to, to various types of in configurations of muscle and essentially rebuilding portions of the peripheral nervous system uh, in a way that we can repurpose however we see fit, which is also kind of amazing to think about. Um, so the, the techniques that we'll need to call into play in the setting of revision procedures will probably be a combination of these two. It'll, the, the one that we performed already um, was where we, we, are, we are actually, the patient had enough native anatomy that we could essentially do what we did in Jim's case, just in a revision scenario. But there's going to be other scenarios in which we have to basically build these pieces from scratch. Um, right now, the protocol that we have in place um, allows us to consider patients who are victims of trauma, who have congenital abnormalities, had oncologic procedures, 
Currently, it's not approved for patients with severe peripheral vascular disease histories because it's important. Those patients also tend to have significant um, dysfunction of their peripheral nerves, and they, we can't utilize the nerves in the same way. But, but it, it may be that in the future, we can actually apply these techniques to vascular patients as well. So patients with diabetes, for example, who have, amputation, who have had amputations for diabetes? We need, to, we need to consider them carefully. We need to make sure that their peripheral nerves are still working normally enough to make them good candidates for these types of procedures. So it, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a relative contraindication. It'll be something where somebody came in inquiring about their uh, suitability for the procedure. We would consider it in the, in the spectrum of all the things we consider for screening. It may not uh, knock them out specifically, but we would look at it very, very carefully. Do um, another question here was how, so it's questions about how the, um, robotic limbs are actually communicating with the biological limb. Um, in, the, in the film, um, in the lab, um, G Jim had electrodes that were attached to, the, to his uh, remaining leg uh, that were then wired into the uh, prosthetic. Can you just talk about how, what are the signals the limb actually picks up um, and, and where is that going? Are there some advances happening in that regard? Do you want to address that? Yeah, sure. So the simplest is to take what's called surface EMG, which are the signals that emanate to the surface of the skin. And these are electrical signals that occur every time a muscle or a nerve um, activate. So we can pull those and, and decode those to have a sense of motor intent, what, what the person wants to do you can send those to the robot. Um, a slightly more sophisticated version is to actually get signals directly from the muscle using implanted electrodes. Um, and we've now worked with newer technologies wherein you can tunnel these electrodes out through a bone, um, bone-based tunnel, so an implant in the bone, um, and receive direct muscle signals. Um, and in the future, we could think about also getting signals directly from nerves um, and using a combination of these to really optimize the electrical signals that are both being taken out of the body, as well as the electrical stimulation that we can provide to the body uh, to you know, perform um, the transmission of sensory feedback from a prosthetic device to the human. So thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, and um, I wanna uh, thank, um, Dr. Cardi and uh, Jim and Matt Orr and Tria for joining us today um, and for answering these questions. Um, I wanna thank the audience for, for being with us. I'm sorry we can only get to some of your questions, um, but I hope if you haven't already that you will watch the, uh, the documentary. Um, it's now available for streaming. It's online at pbs.org slash Nova. That's again, pbs.org slash Nova. Uh, and it's also available on the PBS video app. Uh, thanks very much to Nova uh, for having shown our film um, and to all of you out there for taking the time to join us. Uh, thanks again, stay safe and be well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye-bye.